Let me know if I need to move. Such a nice day. Mm -hmm. They still have snow machines in case it's not cold enough to make snow. Yeah, that's what they do. It'd be fun if you're a dirt biker. Mm-hmm. I got everything on this mountain too.
sliding down, they temporarily closed the lift because they thought they had a fire. Oh wow. They were firing up the generator on top at the summit house. Oh. And it released a puff of smoke. <laughs> so they temporarily stopped this one? Until they confirmed it wasn't a fire, yeah. Oh, okay. always like bigger than they look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. 
one-way ticket and walk down. Plus down would be more scenic. See anybody come down yet? I guess I can put more chairs on it than you. Mm -hmm.
Chile's coming down. Ooh. Chile. Well, I think that's where over the mountain we'll be fine. Yeah.
can't tell if these are houses or lodges over here. They look like houses. Yeah. This one has like toys and stuff. Oh, he cleaned it up. He was embarrassed. What? The dad came out while I came up with the chair left earlier and got rid of all the toys. Oh. Yeah, big old dog on their porch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty. Guess we're building a new one. Yeah. are so pretty.
not as bad. I have no idea.
grown? Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Sometimes it's hard to skip those rocks if they're not nice and flat.
great. I don't know. It's probably my lotion. It puts the lotion on the skin. So it gets the hose again. It's 
so you're going to enjoy that video with me jumping all over the place. I'm probably going to have to edit this one. I don't want to put it out of the They're all over. Let's go. I just need to get the roof out of it. Sorry.
Warm in the sun.
trying to be I'm trying to be prepared. One person asked me for decaf once and I just I don't like to brew it if nobody else is gonna know what's going to really do half and half. Half and half? Okay, interesting. I will make sure that they brew hot. Did you want your puppy? Yes. One second, I accidentally pressed the sun.
International for your cruise down upper water tonight today. And as you notice already, we've turned out of the marina here. And get a little bit of a breeze here today, not too bad by any means. The speed of the boat, the speed of the wind, make for a little bit of AC, I guess, out here. Not that we need it today, it's not that hot yet. But uh, if you do need to move around the boat, if it does get a little bit too cold up here for you, you are more than welcome to make your way downstairs to the main cabin with a nice small group here today definitely more than enough room for everyone so feel free to move around the boat take up or stand up take some pictures walk around You're more than welcome to do that just be mindful of your footing as you do move around the boat there is a ladder way at the back as well and if you miss the first step on that you'll miss the next six or seven as well so please take your time moving around the boat before we get going too far i am required by the u.s transport to give you a real brief safety talk so it's similar to when you step aboard an aircraft, except here on the boat, uh, the emergency exits are pretty self-explanatory, I think. Uh, the International License to Carry 165 Passengers, as such, we carry 168 adult life jackets for your crew as well. And then we have children's life jackets aboard for many children and infants we have here today. On the upper deck, the life jackets to the left of myself up here at the wheelhouse, as well as at the very back, under the back bench. For anyone downstairs in the main cabin, as well as the back of the boat, we call the fantail area. Your life jackets are in the main cabin, along the rooftops above your head. Besides that, you may have also noticed that one big white barrel on the upper deck at the very back. That is a self-inflated life platform. So in the unlikely case, we had to abandon ship, pull a Titanic, I guess. We simply pushed that over, we all pile safely aboard that, and from there we get the paddles out to start paddling, right? Get you your money's worth and make our way around still. Now, all kidding aside, we do have your safety concerns well at hand. Now, your crew, we are all trained in man overboard, firefight, and first aid. And despite all of our youthful looks, we have been doing this for many years. So, uh, me and your first mate were actually both Canadian captains as well. Uh, introduce your crew. You are captain up here at the helm, Captain Phil. Captain Phil, one of our very most experienced captains of the company. It's his third day on the job. 
I'm his 22nd year. So he's a very experienced captain out here. He knows this lake like the back of his own hand. So he'll be following the shoreline. He knows all the spots where we can get nice and close and the spots where we have to stay a little further out. So we have a well veteran captain at the helm. Your first mate today is Jeremy. He'll be walking around with the crew jacket and the crew shirt on. And so Jeremy was born and raised here in Waterton. species of bears, the black bear as well as the grizzly bear. Typically from the boat, we typically will see the black bear. Uh, the grizzly bear, a little bit fewer in numbers, and they actually prefer the higher elevations or more towards out on the prairie. So we don't usually see grizzly bears from the shore side, but uh, as we make our way down, you'll be able to scan some alpine meadows for the grizzly bear too, potentially. We have elk that we'll see in those alpine meadows. So yesterday, some folks on board, and I actually saw them as well, some mountain goats in the high country. So if you have your telephoto lens or binoculars, you can make use of those for sure. Down at the far end of the lake is some of the best moose habitat in Waterton and Glacier Park. Keep your eyes open for the moose as we continue along the shoreline, often in the spring. So this time of year, they're coming down, the mothers are coming down to the shoreline to give birth. And the reason they do that right along the edge of the lake is because it actually will eliminate you know, 180 degrees of potential area that predator could come from. And those moose, they are very good swimmers. The baby moose can take to the water almost as soon as they can walk. So if the need is there, the mother will force that calf to swim right away. And uh, usually every year we'll, we'll see a few moose down along the shoreline. If we're lucky, we may even see a uh, moose with that newborn calf. So we'll keep our eyes open. A little bit less common, but we have had in the last 10 years two sightings of cougars or the big kitty cats, the mountain lions from the boat. They are quite rare to see, although we do have a very healthy population of those mountain lions. We've also had one mountain goat swim across the lake. You typically, you don't see a mountain goat down off the high alpine slopes, but uh, if you ask me why he swam across the lake, why he even came down this far, I don't know. I don't know, maybe 
me to get a new change of scenery. It's hard to say. Get away from the naps, but we'll keep our eyes open. Even more rare than a mountain goat swimming across the lake, we had a lynx swim across the lake last year. I've never actually seen a lynx. I've lived here my entire life. never seen a lynx. And the crew that day on the boat on that cruise, they actually saw one swim across the lake. So we never know. We never quite know what we're going to see out here. About a week ago, I saw a golden eagle right down at the edge of the lake. Just last week, I saw a bald eagle take out a Canadian goose. It was their Thanksgiving, I guess. I don't know. But uh, you never know. There's a lot happening out here. They are wild animals, of course. It's not a zoo, so keep the wild in the wild. And uh, it's hard to say what we'll see, but just keep our eyes open. If you see something, be sure to let us know. Get our attention. We'll slow down. Hopefully, get a little bit closer and give you folks some good photo opportunities. Uh, I, of course, don't see everything I'm facing backwards. And your captain, he's focused on the busy road ahead. So that's your one job today, besides enjoying yourselves, is to keep your eyes open. As we do make our way around the lake, I can definitely point out a few of the mountains for you folks. Many of the mountains around here were named after some of the first explorers who came to the area what was known as the Palliser Expedition. In the 1850s mapping this area out. So for that reason we have names like Richards, Olsen, or Campbell. Not a whole lot of meaning to the names of those mountains, but definitely the ones that are a little more prominent I can point out here. And one of the ones I like to start off with, definitely everyone has seen Mount Vimy off the left hand side. A little bit different view now, but Mount Vimy, a very special mountain. Of course named after that famous World War I battle in Vimy Ridge, in France, where Canadian troops were the only ones able to take that ridge. So it was named in honor of those troops who fought and died. Also Mount Vimy there is the only mountain here in Waterton that is a trail right to the top. So you can actually hike right to the top of Mount Vimy on a trail the whole way. All the other mountains, there's no trail. They are hikeable. People have done it. Uh, definitely, that's what your crew here like to do. Between the three of us, we've hiked every mountain you'll see around the lake. So you're really in for a long day of bushwhacking through the thick forest, finding that rock bridge, and then rock crawling or scrambling right to the very top of that mountain. So that's Mount Vimy off the left. So here on our right hand side, we're Cruise by Mount Bertha, kind of back in the valley here over towers the campground in town, Mount Bertha. Mount Richards up ahead of us here on the right as well. You'll notice the forest here a little bit. Does anyone know what happened here? Who heard about the fire we had last year? Yeah, lots of people. Yeah. The Kino fire, a fairly major fire here in Waterton. Give you a little bit of a background on that. I always get questions right at the start, so I might as well talk about the fire a little bit. And then the Kino fire, to give you an idea of the size of this fire, Waterton Park is 525 square kilometers, and about 75% of the park burnt. 75% of the Waterton Park burnt. And the fire started in the Akamina Kishnia Park, BC, about nine miles to the west of us, on the other side of the continental divide. And it started on August 30th. It was a very small fire. It was only about a couple hectares in size. So at first, there was no worry to anyone. It was out of the way, away from any assets, any people, and any development. So they actually just left it. It was not a problem. What happened, though, is that fire started to spread. The south wind, we're experiencing it right now. The wind continued to blow, and that fire actually jumped over the continental divide. It started to blow uh, down towards this area here, right to the town site actually. And everything here was evacuated. The town site was emptied out. Firefighters came in and deployed hoses and sprinklers around the edge of the town site to try to combat that blaze. And they did a very good job. Of course, you can see the town site survived. And we only lost the horse stables as well as the visitor centers. So it's unfortunate for sure that the horse stables already started to rebuild. Typically, you can hike there. There is a trail that starts right at the Washington town sites and will follow this shoreline that we're cruising along right now, right to the end of the lake. 14 kilometers of hike along that trail. Besides taking the boat, that is the only other way to get down to Goat Hunt, is by taking that shoreline trail. Along the base of Mount Richards here, we'll be able to see up ahead here where the fire ended. Now, like I did mention, there was a south wind that brought that fire down towards the town site. And that south wind is what we have right now. 
what happened after the night of September 11th when that fire came down. The wind switched on the 12th and actually started to blow that edge of the fire down towards the end of the lake here. So we made it a couple kilometers down the lake. Uh, luckily though, that cooler weather that we get when a north wind comes in was able to help bring that fire to an end. Right here in this area, we'll see up ahead on the base of Mount Richards. A little bit of a waterfall there. It's actually quite small now. Uh, only a week ago, that waterfall was raging. Lots of snow up in the side of Mount Richards here. Actually, now it's starting to dissipate a fair bit, but in the spring that will be full of water making its way down. But mostly burnt here, what that we're seeing are the lodgepole pine on the right hand side. Those lodgepole pine actually need fire to move around and to regrow. Of course, for humans, fires are devastating, right? They are hard on our air quality, they attack our assets, our livelihood. But in terms of for a forest for this area, it is natural for it to burn and it's part of the rejuvenation cycle. The pine trees that we're seeing here have what we call a serotonous cone, a very tightly woven cone that contains the seeds. And these cones only open up under extreme heat. So in this area, that will only come around in the form of a fire. So as that fire comes through, those cones will burst, releasing the seeds into the air. With a little wind tip and the warm air rising from the flames, those seeds are carried high above. As that fire passes, those seeds then come back down and are laid down in that nutrient-rich ash on the forest floor, and from there, before it shall replay. So it is a natural cycle that takes place. Uh, the lodgepole pine, a fairly young tree, not made for the mountainous, shady area we have here. Uh, those, what we call a dog hair stand here on the right hand side. Uh, the pine trees, uh, the pine trees here, uh, they are a sun loving tree and growing in the mountains, they don't get enough sun as well as the dog hair stand very closely together will cut back on the tree's life expectancy by about 50 years. So these trees don't live much past 100 years here, these lodgepole pine. At that point, either you have fire that comes in or you'll have different types of insects. Uh, the pine beetle, we have the, them here. Now, at this point, we don't have an infestation or anything like that, but they are always around. Uh, the pine beetle, we have the spruce budworm and Douglas fir beetle as well attacking the appropriate trees. But once these pine trees start to die out, you have a much more mature forest start to develop, like we have off the left. Uh, the forest off our left-hand side here hasn't burned since the mid-1800s. So after these lodgepole pine die off, you have the Douglas fir, Indelman spruce, and the large trees that come in, come in a little bit higher up as well. So you see a lot of standard death on the bottom left-hand side overall as we continue down the lake.
locals here have boats that never get used anywhere else besides this lake. Right now, they're not allowed to use them, so there is definitely some frustration, as you can call it. There. So they're working on a, a plan to allow boats after the
evacuated. So we actually didn't leave. They can't force you out of your house there because it's not federal land. It's not federal land. So we, we actually didn't leave. But uh, most people did. And uh, we had just moved out of here. So we had everything there. So we, we loaded up. We were ready to go. And the night of the 11th, we watched that fire burn towards our house. It ended about three kilometers from our house. So we were ready to try to do something a little bit. We actually started flooding the property out in front of our house about three days prior. We have a spring on our property. So we started taking that two inch hose and just let it run around our house to try to green that grass up as much as we could, which we did. But luckily the fire didn't quite make it to our house. So. And not the case for some of the residents. Some of our good friends outside the park did lose their homes. A couple ranches did burn on Rock and Heart Ranch. Hearts go out to them for sure. Uh, they were able to get all the horses out, and as well as the stables that burnt in town. All the horses, they got all the horses out, so no livestock or any lives were taken by the fire, which is great to see as well. We're slowing down now because we are coming upon the border. Take a look off the left hand side. You'll see a straight narrow swath making its way to the side of Mount Boswell. That is the border between Canada and the U.S. That also marks 49 degrees north. So you'll see that on the left there. On the right hand side here, we'll have a much better view in just a moment. Coming into view now for the bow. You'll see these two carpeting markers are on the left. When you line one of these up right in front of the other, that means you have a surveyor's view of the border, 49 degrees north. So the border itself coming into view is about 20 feet across. And it's actually cut every year by a team of trained beavers we have on leashes. <laughs> no, just kidding. And it's cut every 10 to 15 years by either the Canadian or US Park Trail teams. They'll take turns going up there with chainsaws, axes, and brush cutters and clear that accordingly. Actually, I had some friends today that I dropped off on the left hand side. They went up the side of Mount Boswell. They're going to hike right up that cut line to the ridge and then they're going to try to make their way up to the peak of Mount Boswell on the left there. So if you see anyone walking up that cut line, they're not jumping the border, they're just hiking the border. <laughs> they just told me they're almost on the ridge line. They can see the boat from where they are. So they're probably up in the third where all the rocky area is. Apparently they can see us. I don't know if you can see them. These were two different areas being managed differently by different administrations, but they both had similar goals in mind. So at that point, Rotarians from Alberta and Montana started to lobby their respected federal governments to so declare this area as one. And they were successful in 1932. So since 1932, this area, now known as Waterton Glacier International Peace Park, is the very first of its kind in the world, displaying that friendship and unity between Canada and the U.S. And that is, of course, why we were able to cross so easily there. Up ahead of us here, we'll see Boundary Creek in just a moment, flowing into Boundary Bay. One of the mountains that's definitely noteworthy along the right hand side, you look down to the far end of the lake along the right, there is a mountain there that has multiple jagged pinnacles or peaks, one of the more scenic mountains, most photographed as well, and that is Mount Citadel, Mount Citadel of Porcupine Ridge. To the old timers of the area, they called that old Sawtooth Mountain, and the First Nations knew it as Atanyawaxis, which roughly translates to needles touching or needles in the heavens, and then the kids call it T-Rex Mountain, to get a bite out of it, right? If there are any geologists on board, they know that as a glacial arete. Montana, one of my favorite places to be honest. Come down here to go hike, and go hike for days, and not see another person, it's great. One of the least populated states for sure, less than a million people live in the state of Montana. And there's more people in Calgary, Alberta than all of Montana. We can also flip that around. There's more people in the state of California than all of Canada, so it just depends what you like, right? Each to their own. Do we have any American citizens on board here today? Okay, a fair number. Welcome home. <laughs> Anyone from Montana? No. Anyone's first time to Montana? A few folks. Uh, welcome. So we'll continue cruising.
cruising down the lake now. I'm actually going to cross over up ahead here in a couple minutes and do that figure eight I was talking about. about the snowfall here in Waterton and at our elevation here which is 4,200 feet above sea level. Um, to give you a little bit of perspective, the mountains on average here above us 8,000 feet. It's so about 4,000 feet at a vertical relief between us and many of the summits we're looking at. Uh, in terms of snowfall, typically our snowfall is about 220 inches which is about 15-20 feet of snow every year and this year did 130% of our average snowfall, so it's a fair bit of snow here in this area. 
Uh, I know myself, I didn't stay here all winter this year. I took off and elsewhere, but uh, there were some spots in town that had 15, 20, 25 foot drifts. You know, what happens is when the lake freezes over, which it does, usually around Christmas time, this lake will freeze end to end, and then it'll snow, right? It'll snow in the lake, the wind will pick up again, and all that snow will blow right onto the town site from the whole lake here. So that's how the drifts will occur right along the edge of the lake. If you go for a walk around town tonight, there's a little nice pathway that goes around the entire skirt of the town, and you see some of those lake front cabins. And remember, as a young kid, coming down to the water's edge, you'll see the cabins completely covered in snow. You can actually walk up one side and slide down the other side, right over top of the house. Down there. It is a very cold winter spot here. The town site is open. There's actually two hotels and one restaurant that will remain open year round, as well as the liquor stores. I guess it tells you what happens here a little bit. Only about 50 people, only about 50 people will stay here year round. And they're very easy to pick out as you walk around town. Just look for the people that walk with the tilt, right? Just like the trees. During the summertime, though, our population will jump up to about 3,000. With the various, or I should say, all the hotels and restaurants being open and fully staffed now. The shoulder season of May and June and then September, October, probably my favorite time to be here. Of course, you can have very nice weather. A little bit cooler, which isn't bad, but it also keeps the crowds down. So. It's like you have a place to yourself almost. You walk around town at night here, you walk in the middle of the street, right? There's no one driving around, it's nice, nice and quiet. That's what I enjoy most. Now the Parks Canada boat off our right-hand side there, making its way back down towards the water town site. That's their park service boat. side across from us now we're looking at the base of Mount Campbell. Along Mount Campbell you'll notice those alpine meadows. And those alpine meadows at this time of year is where we often spot the grizzly bears and the elk. Not a bad area to stand. Beautiful spot. You see some of the avalanche shoots there with some snow still, a little waterfall coming down from the high country. Uh, yesterday on the boat off of our left hand side here is Goat Hond Ridge. Up ahead of us is Flat Top Ridge. And that is where we saw the mountain goats up above the tree line. If you have a keen set of eyes, you can look for mountain goats as well. I always tell people, if you think you see one of those, you stare at it for about two minutes. If it moves, well, chances are it's a goat. If it doesn't move, chances are you spotted what I like to call a snow goat, right? If you get my drift. a pair of bald eagle down here at this end of the lake. They often will be hanging out along the shorelines as well, looking for fish to linger into the shallow waters for that snap. So we often see them sitting at the top of the trees right along the edge of the lake. Very distinctive white and head tail feathers, so we'll keep our eyes open for them as well. Uh, yesterday we also saw a immature bald eagle. Looks a little bit like a golden eagle might, as those immature bald eagle don't have the white and head tail feathers.
Now up ahead of us on the right hand side there, you may have noticed the Janet Valley now come into view. To the right hand side of the Citadel Peeps. From the Janet Valley, see some snow fields up high in the valley there. And those aren't glaciers, they're just snow fields. Folks often ask, what's the difference? If they are. So I guess I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, a glacier is defined as a moving mass of snow and ice. Allows that glacier to move is what we call a critical mass. So to reach that critical mass, it has to be about 60 feet thick, 20 meters thick. At that point, there's so much weight on the bottom layer that it actually will change molecular structure and it becomes what we know as firm. I'm trying to figure out our system here. It just started to operate a couple days ago and looks like if we put a phone close to any kind of the equipment back here it starts to make some static. So I'm just trying to figure that out still a little bit. Like I was saying though, that bottom layer of the glacier becomes what we call fern. It's super compressed and it's like, kind of like if you had a snowball in your hand, you squeeze it, all the water squeezes out and then you have almost like an ice ball. So that's kind of like that bottom layer of fern, but it's very elastic like. So it allows that glacier to very slowly start to move down the side of the mountain. So as these glaciers are moving, they are grinding rocks together, picking up these rocks and grinding them, super compressing them. So it's similar to if you took two small rocks along the shoreline back in town, rub them together very quickly for a minute, that creates a very fine sediment, and that sediment is known as rock flour or glacial flour. So the glaciers create this in very large amounts. And then each spring with these snow melts as well as the rain, that sediment is picked up in the creeks and streams, deposited down into the lake, where it neither floats nor sinks, but it will actually stay suspended in the water column. So if you take a look now, you see that a little bit of an emerald green color to the water, and that's from the, the rock flower in the water. We go up to some of these alpine lakes at the base of the glaciers, or even in other parks you may have been to lakes where it's almost a turquoise green in color, right? If you were to take your glass of water, scoop some water out there, hold it up to the light, you may actually be able to see the little particles of rock within the water. Just don't drink it. You might get stoked. Right? shaped building right down below the Jana Valley and Citadel Peaks off to our right. That's actually the new Starbucks. <laughs> it's not open yet. No, it's not Starbucks. It's actually the boathouse for the International. The International it was built back in 1926 and 1927 right here on the lake. 91 years old. This it's actually the oldest passenger vessel, wooden passenger vessel, still in operation in Canada as well as west of the Mississippi. So there's a piece of living history here. And that is where we store the boats at the great A shape over there, the boathouse we call it. And headed down the lake there are the US Border Patrol. They kind of tell us when we're allowed to land and not, so we just play by the rules. And down here at Goat Haunt, though, definitely a beautiful spot. Very remote area of the 
National Park. From Goat Haunt to the nearest road into the glacier into the States is 32 miles away, 50 kilometers. And that comes in the form of the Dwight to the Sun Highway. Over multiple mountain passes and the highest density of free roaming grizzlies in the lower 48 states. Sound like a fun hike. <laughs> it is. It is a lot of fun. Uh, usually it's done in two or three days. Some folks refer to it as the dash. It can be done in a day. It's a long day. It's something I want to do this year. Me and your first mate Jeremy were going to run that, jog that trail. Just start and go into the sun and then end up here at night. Hopefully make it here by 8 to catch the last boat back during the summer. Or else it turns into a long night. During the summer months, there are six to ten people that live down here. They all work for the U.S. Park Service. There's three trail crew, a maintenance guy, usually two or three rangers, and a couple interpretive uh, staff members that will meet the boat when we're about to land. At this point, there's no one living down here. They're having some boat problems, and they haven't made it down yet. But uh, pretty nice area to live, if you ask me. Anyone here think they could stay down here for three months or so? Yeah, for sure. No Wi-Fi though. That's all right. No big deal, right? No Wi-Fi, no problems. <laughs> a couple beers and a fishing rod. <laughs> Definitely. If you like your solitude and just beautiful, peaceful area, this is it. Off the left-hand side is the information center. A little bit of information for the backpackers that we drop off as well as the hiker shuttles, so that's where they can camp for their first night or their last night as they come in or out. It's off the left there. And then down on the right hand side you'll see where the Border Patrol landed their boat. That is the Snowflake Pavilion just past them. And that is the official port of entry. So once the customs agents make their way down here for any of the most of the that's where you have to clear customs and continue on into the back country. They are very self-sufficient down here on the roof off our left-hand side of the information center there. You will see some brackets which hold the solar panels that they set up to run the lights. And then in their bunkhouse, which is a little bit ways back in the forest behind the information center, off the, or I should say behind the snowflake pavilion off the right there, uh, they have more solar panels as well as up the creek a little ways they have a hydroelectric turbine which creates more than enough power, all DC power, and they actually have a little building full of heaters to burn off the excess power that's coming in. That's how efficient it is. So if anyone here has a little bit of land and you have a stream running across that land and you have an extra quarter million, you could have some solar panel or you could have your own system there. Very expensive for sure, but it creates all their power. Yesterday we saw the loons down here as well, so keep your eyes open. Some swallows fly flying around, they always nest around this area. Had a Canadian goose along the shoreline yesterday, I don't know where he is. I'd be pretty scared if I was him. Bald eagle have been eating the geese recently this year. I've seen two Canadian geese get eaten by bald eagle this year. They have a taste for them now. It's the first time I've ever seen that here in Waterton. They are. Yeah, the geese are a bit burnt. I was pretty surprised when I heard the bald eagle were taking out geese. You only have to eat once or twice a week. And bald eagles are large birds too. They have about a six foot wingspan as well. So definitely the pair, nesting pair down here could do that, no problem. We'll cruise by the area where their nest is on the way back along the left hand shoreline. So hopefully we see them. They're often around. One of my favorite birds of prey out here that we have. They are monogamous, so they mate for life. Coming back to the same nest now, this pair on the lake for about 12 years. How they mate, that's a whole nother story. They actually will fly up to the tops of these mountains, about 8,000 feet. At that point, they'll lock talons midair and start to mate as they free fall down towards the earth, breaking apart only a couple hundred feet above the earth's surface. Talk about pressure, right? <laughs> Thank you. 
way down the lake now, sort of by the boathouse here. Folks often ask, well, why would you build a boat down here? Why not at town where it's more accessible? And the reason being, international here is U.S. registered, and in order to be U.S. registered, it has to be built on U.S. soil. So at the time, simply put, there was not the road infrastructure or the equipment to move a boat this large by road. So they actually prefabbed the boat, made the boat in pieces in Kalispell, Montana. They shipped those individual pieces up by railway to Tardston, and from Tardston they drove them on truck and trailer into the town site, floated these pieces down the lake, where it took six men just over seven months to assemble the boat down here in Dodo. Of course, at that time, no power tools, right? All by hand. So pretty, pretty major undertaking for sure. Besides that, I did talk for the majority of the way down, and I told you I didn't want to wreck your trip. So here comes the best part. I'll set the mic down and let you folks enjoy your time here with your family and friends. I will circulate around the boat, so if you do have any questions, of course, feel free to pull me aside. I'm happy to talk one-on-one -on -one a little bit. And as we continue down the lake, you won't notice as much wind because we will be going with the wind, so it'll be a nice time to be up here on the upper deck for sure. Uh, like I said before, move around, take pictures, go up to the bow, do the Titanic pose, whatever you like. <laughs>
and you look to the east, you can see those markers on top of the ridges continuing on where the border crosses. It was defined in the Treaty of 1908 that where the border exists must be clearly identified. So in the mountains, they cut the trees, the prairies, I'm sure they just cut the grass a little shorter. And essentially where there's nothing up in those rocky areas, they erect concrete markers or obelisks. before I dropped some of my friends off this morning. They're along the ridge now up there, so we're gonna try and get some pictures of them. Uh, just like that, we're back in Canada, eh? <laughs> Canadians say, eh? Hey. Beautiful view off the left-hand side now. Looking into the Boundary Valley, on the far end there, you're seeing that large patch of snow on Mount Custer. That is the Herbst Snowfield, Herbst Snowfield. Recently reclassified in 2010 from a glacier to a snowfield. So we lost that critical mass. Also in the background there, to the right-hand side of Mount Custer, that little bit of a saddle, another peak is Mount Forum. Along Mount Forum, right at the summit, there's a huge pile of rocks, and this pile of rocks marks the intersection of Alberta, BC, and Montana. So two, prevent, two provinces in a state meet on top of Mount Forum. The one, yeah, right beside Mount Custer, the one with the glacier is Mount Custer, or sorry, at the snowfield. It's Custer, then to the right, there's a little bit of a saddle and a lower peak, that's Forum.
couple of questions on the way down about geology. Anyone want to talk about geology? Yeah. Do we have any geologists? No, no geologists. All right, I'll talk about geology then. <laughs> I'm no expert. I don't pretend to be by any means, but uh, I did take a course called Rocks for Jocks in college. So <laughs> do my best, right? Up ahead of us here, we're going to cruise by some cliffs where I'll be able to point some rock formations out quite well. To start off talking about geology, let's jump back in time a little bit. Uh, 1.6 billion years. Try and comprehend 1.6 billion, right? It's pretty hard. At that time, they say this was a shallow inland sea, a low lying trough, and what we now know as the Canadian Shield was a large mountain range. Uh, bringing down from that mountain range, the sediments, sands, and silts were deposited into this area, southern Alberta here. And over time, weight, and compression, these layers of sediment were building up here on the shallow floor. And then with that compression over millions of years, formed sedimentary rock. Uh, essentially, sedimentary rock is just compressed mud and silts and sand. So that is 98% of the rock we have here. We have a little bit of igneous and even less metamorphic. So you'll see these layers of sediment rock come into view now. Very prominent layers. You'll also notice that these layers are at about a 30 degree angle compared to the flatness of the water, thrusted upwards at that angle. This is the local cliff jumping spot as well. Right off the cliff face here, over 90 feet of water, two feet off that cliff face. So that's included in the price of the tour if anyone wants to try. So from 1.6 billion, we're going to jump ahead to 100 million years ago. 100 million. Uh, through the movement of the tectonic plates, theory of plate tectonics, the continental, the North American continental plate, collided with the Pacific Oceana plate. The Oceana plate being heavier was thrusted downwards, the continental plate upwards. So if you were to move one hand over top of the other, you can kind of see how the buckling and bending, the upthrust would occur here. And that's what thrusted these layers up. Now there's a fold in the rock, I'll point out. It is only about six feet, or about two meters up from the edge of the lake, right down at water's edge. And for anyone that can't see where I'm pointing, it's straight across from the bow right now. It's a V-shape followed by a capital A-shaped fold, right at the edge of the lake. Now if you look below the V and above the A, you'll notice the rock in those areas is actually bent without cracking. So that shows that over time, weight and compression rock is able to bend. Essentially, that's with no external heat source as well. Who knew rock could bend? It just takes millions of years. Now, we were originally told by geologists that was a chevron fold, so I called it that for a while. Then I was corrected, told it was a recumbent fold. Very quickly again, I was corrected, told it was a syncline followed by an anticline. And now it's just a V-shape followed by an A-shape. Okay. Keeps me out of hot water with the geologists. rather unique. The National Geographic has actually come out here a number of times to photograph that fold. Um, not because you won't find it anywhere else, but because this is a very small, compact example that anyone that's not a geologist can see. That the larger scale folds in the mountains here, a little bit harder to pick out to the untrained eyes. So that's why they got close-up pictures of that. Now, as you make your way around water center, as you look around the mountains here, you may see different layers of red rock throughout these mountains. And that red rock known as argillite. And the argillite has about a 3% degree of iron within the rock. So this speaks to the Earth's atmosphere at the time that, that sediment was laid down in that shallow inland sea. The only fossils we'll find here are known as stromatolite. It was a blue-green algae bloom that would bloom in these shallow inland seas and pollute our atmosphere with oxygen. So at the time, if there were these stromatolites living in the shallow inland sea, that 3% of iron within that, uh, that rock that was being laid down as sands and debris would oxidize, turn that rusty red color. If there was no stromatolite, it was a die-off period, and there was nothing living in that shallow inland sea, giving off oxygen, the rock would come down, or the rock would have formed as this green kind of color. So as you make your way around Waterton Park, you may find rocks that are maybe an inch, half an inch thick. One side will be completely red, which is oxygen present. The other side completely green, so no oxygen present in the Earth's atmosphere. And those stromatolite are also found on the very tops of the mountain. So the only fossils we have here 
were at the bottom of that shallow inland sea as a plant, and now they're found at the very tops of the mountains. So that doesn't really make sense, right? Normally, if you're to survey a mountain range, you find the older layers of rock lower down, and as you work your way up, the younger layers of rock. Uh, the opposite here is found. In this area known as the land of the upside down mountains. So this occurred because of a low-lying fault line known as the Lewis overthrust that was found to the southwest of our position. This low-lying fault line about a six degree angle. And the easiest way to explain overthrust, and I guess, is if you have a cake, all right? Take that cake, for example, with the layers, cut it in half so you can see the different layers within the cake. And now you're gonna cut it again at a nice low-lying six degree angle. With forces from underneath the plates, one was thrusted on top of the other. So these older layers are now moving up above these younger layers. And that's how the oldest rock found at the very tops of these mountains. Some of this rock here uh, dated back to 1.6 billion years. Oldest exposed sedimentary rock in all of North America. Some of it. So pretty cool for sure. If you're into geology, right? Like I said, I'm not an expert. Kind of cool to talk a little bit about. I like to point this out as well as we look across the lake at Richards. You can see where the fire ended here, the green in the forest, but you also notice this little patch, you know, a couple hundred yards further down the lake there. And like I was talking about before, those pine trees have that flammable pitch. So when that superheats, the top of the tree will actually blow off like a bottle rocket. And with that warm air rising, those branches and pieces of the tree that are on fire can be carried uh, very quickly through the forest and start these little spot fires, they're called, further ahead of the fire. So that's a little bit of an example of what happened there. And then you can even see a couple other little ones ahead of that little burn there. Here you see Crypt Ridge, Vimy, or sorry, Vimy Ridge in the background. This is the Crypt Valley. Uh, Heldorn Creek up ahead here drains that Crypt Lake. For anyone that's interested in hiking, that Crypt Trail was actually rated one of Canada's best hikes in the 70s by an outdoor magazine in the area. And then also it was recently rated one of the top 20 thrill and hikes on Earth by National Geographic. Now I can't say anything about that. I haven't hiked every height on Earth, so I don't know myself. But uh, definitely it is very good, and here in southern Alberta, it is one of our premier hikes. The reason it's rated so highly and thrilling is right near the end of the hike, you actually have to climb up a 10-foot high steel ladder. The trail ends, you climb up that ladder, and when you get to the top, you have to start to crawl through a tunnel, 60 feet long. You have to scurry slash crawl through that tunnel, come over the other end a couple minutes later, and you're sitting on a cliff face, looking 600 feet straight down to the valley floor. You make your way around that cliff face, hold it onto a cable that's embedded into the rock, and walking on a ledge that's about two and a half to three feet wide for about 100 yards. Sound like fun? It is fun, yeah. It's a good time if you're into hiking, for sure. I know a lot of people are a little worried about going out in the backcountry here because of the bears, right? Let's be honest. And uh, I don't necessarily think you have to be scared of bears. I think you need to be educated and understand that these animals live here and this is their home. Uh, they don't mind us, though. If they were out there to get us, 
there would be a lot more fatalities out here hiking. Uh, I think in North America there's about one fatality a year. And uh, you think about how many people visit national parks, right, out hiking. So bears, they really want nothing to do with us. We do have two different types, like I said before, we have black bear and grizzly bear. And despite the names, color is probably the worst way to tell bears apart. Black bears can be black, brown, blonde, cinnamon red, and even albino in some places, known as a spirit bear. And completely white, very cool. Never seen one myself, but uh, not in this area anyways. The grizzly bear as well can be a wide range of colors, so really not the best way to go. If you see a bear and you want to tell them apart, what I like to look for myself, the first thing you can start off by looking at is the highest point on the bear's body. Typically the highest point on a grizzly bear is the hump, built muscle behind the shoulder blade, while on a black bear, typically the highest point will be the rump or rear end of the bear. That being said, some of the older black bears do develop a little bit of a hump as well, and that is because they use many of the same techniques to find food. Digging up in the backcountry, the roots, the bulbs, the tubers, plant vegetation. So for that reason, some of the older black bears, they tend to have a little bit of a hump as well, just enough so that it makes it hard to tell which, where the highest point is. So the best way that I look at is the face. And the black bear, much like a German Shepherd, the canine, they have a long protruding snout coming high off their forehead with large triangular shaped ears that stand up on end. Easy to pick out. While the black bear on the other hand, they're much more like, or sorry, the grizzly bear on the other hand, they're much more kind of like a pig face actually. They have that low snout coming low off their face like a pig, and then they have a very flat, almost dished in forehead, broad face. And the ears are rounded over, small rounded over ears. Not like the black bear. The black bear actually has the largest ears of any member of the bear family, those large triangular pointy shaped ears. So that's what I look for is the face. It's probably the best way to go. Uh, if that doesn't work for you, you can always take a look at the claw length. Grizzlies have very long claws, three to six inches in length. The black bears only one to two inches, very small claws, used mostly for climbing trees, where the grizzly bears are using them to dig mostly. Being said, if you can see the claw length, you're too close, right? <laughs> now you have to climb a tree. If the bear follows you up, it's a black bear. If it just pushes the tree right over, it's a grizzly. <laughs> too late by that point, though. I'm just kidding, that never happens. You don't have to worry about that. If you do want to get out there and go hiking, or even just for a little walk off the beaten trail around here, there is a chance you'll see a bear. And a couple of rules to keep in mind while out there in the bear's home here in the backcountry. Number one rule, of course, is to make noise. The best way to make noise is using the human voice. Let out a hooter holler every now and then. Sing songs if you can, or if you can't, it doesn't really matter to be honest in the backcountry. Uh, don't rely on the trinkets though, like the bear bells and the bear whistles. Uh, those bear bells, not to burst your bubble if you have one of those, but scientifically speaking, they are about 100% useless and about 200% annoying. And that very small tinkling sound does not travel very far in the forest, especially in an area like Waterton. It's very windy, it drowns it out, and many of the trails have numerous waterfalls you're hiking by as well. It drowns that sound out very quick. Being inorganic, bears do not relate anything to bells, and they have been shown by nature to be curious animals as well. So combine the two things, uh, the studies have shown they may actually come looking for it, wondering what it is. So for that reason, the locals, we don't use those. Uh, we actually call them dinner bells. <laughs> Best thing I can recommend you do with those, take them home, give them to someone you don't like, right? So then to take a hike, put them on your Christmas tree maybe. Now just rely on the human voice. It's been proven time and time again by radio caller and tracking these animals that when they hear the human voice, they'll move off the trail, causing no problems at all. You'll walk by, you may not even know they're there, they'll be 50, 75 yards off, hunkered down in a bush waiting for you to pass, and no issues at all. The second rule, does anyone know what the second most important thing is? <laughs> exactly, to always hike with someone slower than yourself, right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And of course, avoid, avoiding the bears by making noise, letting them know you're coming, and then keeping your food and garbage with you. That's the best way for bears to get into trouble. Actually, in the national parks during the 50s, 60s, and even into the early 70s, it was seen as normal to feed animals, and feed the bears in particular. They'd line up along the side of the roads, enter into the parks, and people would open up their windows and throw hot dogs, whatever they had available out, and kind of like a tourist attraction. At this time, it was also when we had the most uh, bear encounters and bear incidents. As when you feed a wild animal, 
course, no different than the deers in town now. Uh, they start to rely on you as a food source, and they start to seek you out as a food source. So the bear starts to seek people out as a food source, and then they end up crossing someone on the trail that doesn't have anything for them, or refuses to give them something. They can become quite aggressive. And there's a saying here in the park that a fed bear is a dead bear, and that almost always holds true. So we've, uh, over years now, a few generations of bears, we've been able to work that out of their system. And we have good natural wild bears that don't rely on people, and don't seek people out at all. So it's very good. Uh, the deer in town, not such the case. Those deer are what we call habituated. That means that someone unknowingly maybe has given them a salt vinegar chip or some sort of food, and they go a little bit crazy because think about what they normally eat, right? Grass, it's not, it has nothing on a salt vinegar chip, right? So they start to come up to people. I've actually been riding my bike along the main street after work home, and some folks were having ice cream sitting on one of the benches outside the big scoop, and a deer walked up behind them, not knowing. The guy was sitting there looking at his wife and ate the ice cream out of the guy's hand. So that's not normal, right? It's not good. And then what happens is they get norm or they get uh, used to people. They start to have their babies right in town. The fawns will be born in town, so the next generation grows up without that fear of people. And those mothers become quite aggressive towards dogs, especially. I've seen a number of dogs get stomped and attacked here, and those deer have very sharp hooves and definitely injure or even kill dogs. If you have a dog at this time of year, you want to be careful. Uh, the locals, you see someone walking around that's from here, walking their dog, they always have a big stick. There's a reason for that. <laughs> it's not for walking either, it's for the deer. I always tell people now, if, if you have a dog and you're walking around and the deer acting aggressive, just pull out your bear spray and spray it. The park doesn't let, the park won't let people carry sticks. They don't want you to carry a stick to beat a deer if it comes at you, but you're allowed to spray it. Take it out for four or five hours you can't see, so I don't know. see the deer, the mule deer, you'll see the bighorn sheep, if you're lucky, bighorn sheep are around, and even red fox, you'll see the red fox come to town to prey on the gophers, those golden mantle ground squirrels, you'll see in town, around the campground, especially thousands of them, and the red fox come in and prey on those, usually a little bit later, earlier in the day when the people aren't quite as active, still sleeping, so if you go for a walk later on tonight, keep an eye out. And even bears, I was unloaded my vehicle, the other day, it was about a week ago, I was taking the groceries out of my car, looked up, and there was a little black bear 10 feet from me. Uh, he was minding his own business. He didn't care about me. I looked at him, he looked at me, and he continued walking on. I just actually put my groceries down and walked towards him, took some pictures. Don't do that. <laughs> they're not They're not out there to earn us no They want nothing to do with us, really. And they're just moving through the air again. Are looking for out here, especially right now. This time of year is a little bit of food. It's a hard life for a bear right now, especially in this area. The berry crop, 80% vegetarian, our bears are. So they rely very heavily on that berry crop, and that's not in bloom yet. So at this time of year, like I said before, they'll be in the backcountry digging up roots and bulbs, tubers, stuff like that. Along the shorelines, we'll see them flip over rocks, look up the bugs and insects. They are an animal opportunity though, so if they were to come across a sick or an injured deer, moose, or elk member of the ungulate family, they will feed from that if they can. But uh, for the most part, they don't chase down those healthy animals because it takes too much effort. It's a lot easier for a bear to try to sit down in a big berry bush and eat berries all day, so that's what they tend to try to do. And definitely during the later part of July, throughout August, and then into September as well, that is what they'll focus their time on. Bears will spend up to 20 hours a day eating when the berry crop is in full bloom. How do we know that? Well, there was actually a study done here from the University of Alberta. A couple of biology students came out and they were given kind of a crappy job, you might say. They were assigned a bear to follow around with a baby, a shovel, and a GPS locator for 24 hours. Now, they collected the snack that that bear dropped, and at the end of that 24 hours, they went back to the lab pair of tweezers start counting out the berry seeds. So at the end of the study, we were informed a bear can eat up to about 100,000 berries a day. That's the equivalent to about 20,000 calories. That'd be like you or I going to your local fast food restaurant, say McDonald's, and eat 40 Big Macs. That's a lot of food, right? 
The reason the Bears are doing this, though, is to put on as much weight as they can for that long winter nap ahead of them. And for the female Bears, it's even more important that they put on as much weight as they can because it will actually tie into the pregnancy for that female bear. And the maiden season is mid-May to mid-June, so we're right in the middle of the maiden season for the bears right now. And I can also tell you the mother bear has the shortest gestation period of any large North American mammal, only six to eight weeks. But she will not give birth until the middle of January. So how does that work, right? Right now is the maiden season. The mother also has this natural cycle in her body known as delayed implantation or embryonic arrest. So how this works is during the maiden season now, these mother's eggs will be fertilized by the male bear. And within the mother's womb, the embryo will develop to a certain size, known as the ablastosis state, around 100 cells in size. And then it will cease to develop until it will stop growing and it will stay dormant in the mother's womb for the rest of the summer, all throughout July, August, September, October, and then into November. When the mother bear goes into the den, usually mid to late November, her body will make a decision for her. If she has put on enough weight to support herself and some cubs, those embryos will once again self-implant and continue to grow. If she has not put on enough weight, they'll actually self-abort, dissolve back into the bloodstream's proteins for the mother bear. So it's a survival mechanism. Put in the mother's needs first. For some reason, we have a bad berry crop, she will not become pregnant. If it's a good berry crop, lots of rain, lots of berries out today. She will have, typically in this area, between one and three cubs. The world record being six, we don't see that here, though, usually one to three. And these baby bears will be born in the middle of the winter. They're very underdeveloped when they're born. They only weigh about a pound or two to hold them in the palm of your hand. Very small cubs, takes a lot less energy to have as well. Uh, they're hairless, their eyes are shut, and of course they have bare feet. Uh, bad joke. But uh, right away they're put on the mother's rich milk. And the mother's milk about 20% fat. In comparison, human milk only about two or three. So they do grow very quick. These baby bears, when they come out of the den in the spring, the early spring, will weigh around 15 or 20 pounds already. Cute little fur balls. Even at this time of the summer, maybe 20 pounds now. These cute little fur balls will be following their mother around. And uh, there's been a number of bears. There was one mother I saw this year that has three cubs. Uh, the mother herself was kind of a dark red kind of color, kind of that cinnamon color. Two of her cubs were also cinnamon, and the third cub was jet black. So, like I said, there can be a range of colors. Uh, for the next two to three years, those cubs will follow their mother around, learning how to hunt, scavenge, and survive. They'll winter with her in the den for the next two or three years. After that, she'll kick them out, they'll be on their own. And it's not uncommon for cubs to hang out together for a couple of years to start off. Of course, safety in numbers came out to get a little bit safer for sure. At that point, they'll be on their own though. Two or three years, that's not that bad. Think about the mule deer in town. Those mule deer, big horn sheep, they only keep their, their fawns for six months. And then compare that once again to some of your parents on board. They keep your kids up to 50 or 60 years. <laughs> Maybe being a bear doesn't sound so bad. They sleep all winter, eat all summer, kids for two or three years. Okay. We make our way back towards the town site. Unfortunately, we didn't see any bears. Of course, they are wild animals. It's hard to say, well, they'll be at any point in time. But if you have a little bit of time here, and if you're heading out right away, that's all right too, because everywhere is a good chance to see bears. So whether you head left towards Pigeon Creek at the park gate or then right towards Carston or the U.S. border, either direction you go, there is a good chance to see bears along the drive, as well as moose, elk, all different animals around this area. So keep your eyes open wherever you head after this. Hopefully you will see something. In terms of other things to do in the area, like I mentioned, there's a nice little pathway I'll take around the entire skirt of the town site that's worth taking a walk maybe later on today. Definitely recommend to check out the Prince of Wales Hotel up there on the hill in front of us. And you don't have to be a paying guest. Anyone's allowed to go up there, take a look around, go inside, take a walk around. And the Prince of Wales, again, was built at the same time as the International, 1926 and 27. So beautiful old wooden historic structure up there. Does anyone here stay at the Prince of Wales? Yeah, a few folks. Okay, good number of folks. That's good. Uh, I know at the Prince of Wales, even if you're not staying there, you can go up there. And at 8 o'clock every night, they do a little bit of a historic presentation about the area. So take a listen to that. 
bit interesting. Beautiful views, like I said, looking at the Middle Waters Lake as well as the Upper Waters Valley here. So it's a cool spot to check out. Little paths will take you around Prince of Wales down by Linnet Lake as well behind it. So nice spot to check out. It's usually about this point in the cruise, definitely time of the day where folks will ask us for recommendations on uh, where to eat, gift shops, stuff like that. And in terms of restaurants, it's really hard for us to recommend one over the other. All the restaurants here in town do a very good job. You have to appreciate the fact they have a short operating season, so they all do their very best to put out a good product, keep you happy, and keep you coming back. So I'm sure wherever you go, you will have a great meal. Uh, I know if you're looking for something maybe a little fancier, a couple's night out at the Bay Shore, they have the Lakeside Chop House, nice views over the lake there. It's kind of a little more fancy, I guess. Across from them, Trappers Mountain Grill, I ate there once this year already, and then on the street parallel, there's a really good pizza place with a nice patio I tried out after a hike called 49 Degrees North Pizza. But like I said, anywhere you go, you'll have a great meal. The big scoop along Main Street, get a big slab of ice cream after a hike or after your day. Uh, there's the liquor store at the end of Main Street, right beside the police station, if that helps you. <laughs> Folks often ask, where do you find the deals on cheap beer here? No such thing exists, so don't waste your time looking for deals on cheap beer. But uh, if you like to try local beer out at the Thirsty Bears, uh, I think it's called the Thirsty Bear. It's not the Social House anymore, but uh, the bar with the Bay Shore there. They actually have a really good selection of local beers from the area. If you like micro brews, that's the only place I can guarantee you'll see wildlife. If you're here on the weekend, you walk out in front of the Thirsty Bear about 3 a.m. <laughs> Keep an eye out for your first mate. Besides that, as we make our way into the landing here, I get everyone on the front of the boat to please find a seat again for us. Jeremy will be up there opening the gates to man the lines. On behalf of your captain, Phil, your first mate, Jeremy, and myself, I'd just like to thank you folks for coming out here with us today. If you folks didn't come take the boat, then the three of us, we all be out of a job.
shot because they probably don't like that.
it's going to the bathroom. it looks like. This doesn't seem like it would be eating that. I think it'd be going for berries or something like that. It's like... It's too early for berries. I don't know how I'm going to get by though. No rush. I know, but I really don't want to drive by it. No, I mean no rush, as in I'm fine videotaping. Oh yeah. take over videoing, I can try to take pictures. Well, you need to take through outside. Cards fall. Don't kill it because it's gonna crash. It won't crash. does not care about cars. Don't worry baby, I'm not gonna hurt you. I just wanna get around you. Flies all over it. Probably the same deer that we were filming earlier. Oh, the baby's gone, if it is. <laughs> just chewing on the tree leaf. Cute. Baby. Oh. 